I uh, became involved in packaging safety back in 1976, transitioning from an earlier career in, in uh, reentry aerodynamics with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And uh, over the years, I was at Sandia National Lab, Oak Ridge National Lab. I went to the IEA for three years in the 80s, uh, head of the transport safety unit. And then I went back to the IEA in 1999, again, in the transport safety unit. And when I uh, got too old for the agency, they forced retirement at age 62. Uh, Mike Wangler replaced me in that, and we overlapped for, what was it, 18 months, roughly. And uh, so I was at the IEA when 9-11 happened. And prior to that time, focus was primarily on providing security for nuclear material. Very little effort was paid, very little attention was paid to security of other radioactive materials. What we will be showing in the first couple of uh, modules here are some statements by various officials uh, why we have become concerned about security of the other radioactive materials. I can remember uh, it was about eight months after 9-11, I went to the International uh, Air Transport Association's annual meeting on security and air transport in Rome. And the keynote speaker stood up and talked about the 9-11 event. And he said, we in the air transport industry really have to focus on security. He says, we have to get it right every time. They only have to get it right once. And that makes our job quite difficult to try to outguess what an adversary is planning to do, what his capabilities are, how he might attack you. And so what we'll be presenting here is uh, what has developed primarily since 9-11, but also in the maturity of the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material and the, the uh, rec recommendations that uh, have just recently been published as a result of upgrading requirements in that area. Um, preceding me at the agency was a man by the name of Rick Rawl from the U.S. I don't know how many of you know Rick Rawl. When he came, when he came back, he became more focused in uh, security as well. And I worked with him over the years. We developed a training course that we took to China before the Chinese uh, Olympics to help them gain, get control of the radioactive sources in and around Beijing before the Olympics so that there couldn't, they couldn't use that if, if there was an adversary that wanted to try to attack. And that became the skeleton of what is now the training materials that are available from the IEA at the international level for radioactive materials. Then Rick trans transitioned over and looked at security for nuclear materials and the developing requirements there. I presented a paper at Patrum in San Francisco uh, on our plans for this course, and Rick preceded me with a summary of what he's been doing. We were sitting next to each other. I sat back down after that presentation, and he leaned over and he said, you're going to try to cover radioactive material and nuclear material international and domestic in four and a half days? And I said, yeah, that's what we're going to try to do. And he looked at me and he said, good luck. <laughs> so you may feel like, especially the first couple of days, that you're trying to drink out of a fire hose because we're, there's a lot of information here and it goes in a lot of different directions. It's not a two-dimensional tapestry. It's a three-dimensional tapestry and it's not coming together. You think about it, safety, safety requirements, and all the guidance that goes with that has had something like almost seven decades to mature. The first international regulations were published way back in the early 60s. And that has given the international community 
the time and the ability to work together and have basically a consistent set of requirements. We aren't there with, with security. We basically have one decade of experience for security of all radioactive materials and two to three decades for nuclear material. So it's starting to come together, but it's still complex and quite a mess. Okay. The objective of this module is to give you a perspective on safety versus security. Now, we could spend a week talking about all of the detailed requirements for safety, but that's not our purpose here. But I would hope that most of you have some background in what is required for the design of packages from a safety standpoint. But we're going to go through some of the features of the requirements for safety that potentially interface or impact security. We'll be looking at all modes of transport and I will provide a very brief overview of the safety requirements and the interfaces between that and security. Looking at the toolbox that uh, Young mentioned here, we're down here at the bottom trying to put some tools in that bottom drawer, giving you some basics in that area. Now, the safety regulatory framework basically comes from the IAEA. And it works with member states and with what we know as IGOs, the international government organizations. That, of course, includes the IAEA itself. There's the UN Committee of Experts on the Transport of Dangerous Goods that is part of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, meets in Geneva. It's the one that produces what Jung has already referred to as the Orange Book. Then you have the modal organizations, and I'll talk about those in, in later slides. He's already mentioned the International Civil Aviation Organization as one of those. And we also have regional organizations that apply to specific modes of transport. There's also what we call NGOs, non-governmental organizations. That includes the International Air Transport Association, which works very closely hand-in-hand -hand with ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. You've got the World Nuclear Transport Institute, WINTI, and Mike Valenzano here from Transnuclear is here at the uh, courtesy of WINTI, representing them, and he'll be talking to us later. You have the World Institute for Nuclear Security that Young already mentioned, the International Federation of Airline Pilots Association, and the list just goes on. And all these people are working together, striving for safety, and now for security. So let's look at the safety structure internationally and domestically for a few minutes. The document that you see replicated here, the top, uh, the cover page, is the latest edition of the Regulations for Safe Transport of Radioactive Material. It's identified as now SSR-6, that's the 2012 edition, and steps will be taken within the United States to implement any changes that have come from previous editions and ultimately through uh, pro proposed rulemaking, they, uh, those changes will be implemented in the DOT regulations and the NRC regulations as the regulators see fit. But the objective of the, the safety documents is to apply, a, again, a graded approach based on the potential hazard of the contents. And you look at the contents and establish content limits you then define what the packaging requirements are. The more material it, it uh, transports, the more dangerous that material is, the more rust, robust the package design is, the more requirements that are imposed on a package. So we have different package types, and we'll talk about those. And the regulations also establish various administrative controls, one which turns out to be somewhat of a, a problem between safety and security is hazard communication. And we'll point out why that is a problem. Uh, for the more dangerous materials that are transported, they are packaged in the more robust packages, and they require approval by the competent authorities. In the United States, that's NRC, or that's Mr. Schuler right back here for DOE. And there are other operational controls during transport that are imposed on the packages. 
Now, the philosophy that has grown up in the industry is that safety is achieved by assigning the primary responsibility to the consignor. Now, you may sit there and wonder, who is the consignor? That is the entity, the person, the company, the organization that prepares the package and delivers it to a carrier for transport. At the same time, responsibility is transferred to the carrier to make sure that they follow specific requirements as imposed by the, the consigner and the regulators. It's up to the consigner to select the appropriate package for the type of material and make sure that package has been designed properly, manufactured properly, and maintained according to the requirements. So he prepares the package for transport and that includes such things as marking the package, putting proper labels on it, uh, providing shipment, shipment documentation, and so on. But ultimately, safety is achieved through simple but effective operational controls as the package moves from the consignor to the consignee, who is the receiver of the package. The philosophy, again, with the safety regulations is that Safety is achieved by looking at four key functions. One, that you contain the radioactive materials within the package. You control the external radiation levels. Thirdly, you prevent, the, if it's a nuclear material, you prevent it from going critical. And fourth, you have to prevent damage to the package caused by heat generated in the package or by heat that may be uh, the result of uh, environmental conditions or if it's in some cases if the package is in a fire, for example, you have to protect against that. So the bottom line there, these requirements apply for both normal conditions of transport and for hypothetical accident conditions. Now this shows you the graded approach that's used with the packages. First of all, you have the packages that are basically not accident resistant. They contain very, very small quantities of radioactive material. And if they were damaged in an accident, the materials were released, it's been determined that they would not be hazardous to the environment or to man. These are known as accepted packages, as industrial packages, and type A packages. Then you have the accident resistant packages. and we could spend a lot of time talking about the history of the regulations and where the test requirements come from, but that's not the purpose of our course here. But the accident resistant packages have to be designed to withstand a severe drop test, in some cases a crush test, penetration by a probe, exposure to fire, water immersion, and what I've talked about there are your type B packages that are normally used for transport in surface modes. For large quantities of radioactive material internationally there is a category of packages known as type C and they must go through an even more rigorous set of tests to be certified as type C packages. Then we have special packages that uh, have uh, specific additional requirements imposed on them. One is the uranium hexafluoride packages and they have to uh, be able to survive a certain drop in exposure to fire conditions. That was imposed in the regulations uh, some time ago, not out of a concern for the radioactive nature of the UF-6, but out of a concern of the chemical nature of the UF-6. And also then with fissile materials, we have to account for their potential for nu nuclear criticality. So those packages are identified specifically as fissile materials packages. So, graphically depicted here is, uh, first of all, the packages for the low hazard materials, the accepted packages. What you see, I can't even see it there. It doesn't show up. Oh, thank you, Jim. Got it. What you see up here are the accepted packages, and that's uh, typical of the very small quantities of radioactive materials might be shipped for uh, medical purposes or other, uh, for other reasons. Also in the accepted package area are 
smoke detectors, things like that, that are used in, in homes and uh, industrial applications. Unpackaged material, in some cases you are allowed to transport very low activity materials in an unpackaged situation such as ores that have been mined being carried to further, for, for further processing. Industrial packages, that's the lowest level of type package. Think of a 55 gallon drum. That might be an industrial package. There's actually three levels of industrial packages, IP1, IP2, and IP3. And each one has a specific set of requirements that it has to satisfy. And as the contents become more hazardous, the design of that package also increases. Again, that's applying the graded approach. The uh, moderate hazard materials, these are examples of those. These are known as type A packages. They are designed to withstand normal conditions of transport, but they are not accident resistant per se. The potential for consequences is limited by putting constraints on how much material you can put in those packages. Again, detailed studies have been made for decades now on what happens if that material is released and it's, uh, it depends on, for example, if it occurred in a warehouse versus outside. All of those studies have looked at ingestion and uh, contamination and what the, what the uh, effects would be on humans that might be associated with it and determined to be inconsequential. Typical materials in type A packages would include rate of pharmaceuticals, gauging sources, Here's a technetium 99 generator, other typical type A packages. You'll have, for example, here, a bottle containing the material inside of uh, absorbent material uh, in a can, the can placed in the box. But again, these are, are designed, packages are tested, and they don't have to survive accident conditions of transport. These also are not certified by regulators, but the designers, the users of these packages are subject to audit by the regulators to make sure they're using properly uh, designed packages. For the high hazard materials, we have what's known as the type B package. Anything that's greater than the contents of a type A would be in a type B package. They're resistant to severe accident conditions. Uh, what we see depicted here is uh, some what I call extra regulatory type testing. This, in this case, was a, a test that was done in the United Kingdom many years ago. Locomotive traveling at 100 miles an hour, hitting a 50 ton package that had been simulated to have been derailed and laying on the tracks. Similar tests were done many years ago at Sandia, uh, impacting casks at, uh, with a, into a barrier at high speeds and impacting a locomotive into a cask laying on the tracks and so on. Uh, Long-term th thermal exposures. Basically, the package has to survive a nine meter drop test onto an unyielding target with, uh, in, in most damaging orientation, has to survive a one meter drop onto a puncture bar. If it's a small, low density, lightweight package, it has to uh, uh, survive a dynamic crush test, depending on the contents that are in the package has to survive a half hour fire test uh, without leaking its contents or having the uh, external radiation increase. Uh, typical contents of these include irradiated nuclear fuel, plutonium and uranium compounds, and you can see the list goes on there. We talk commonly in the United States talk about these as casks, and this was a typical uh, smaller cask that would be used. You also have Packages like uh, these that can be small. Uh, you'll see later on uh, pictures of casks that weigh up to 100 tons that are transported by rail for spent fuel and high level waste. So, what are the controls in transport? Yeah. Would you consider a top AF package a moderate or high category? I'm sorry? Top A fizz all package. Uh -huh. Would you go ahead and consider that high hazard for high hazard material? Or would you okay. This is a, an, an anomaly with this is this is an anomaly within the uh, regulations in that the contents are from a radioactive standpoint small enough that it would be in a type A package, but because it's fissile, 
it still has to survive all of the accident condition tests. And have regulatory approval. And have regulatory approval. So for fissile materials, uh, even if it's a type A quantity, that package design has to go through these tests and be certified by the regulator. Uh, the 9975, I think, is the type AF, isn't it, Jim? 79. 79, excuse me. Uh, and, uh, but it's still, that, that has been exposed to the 9 meter drop test, the fire test, and so on. And in this case, you're ensuring that it doesn't go critical after the, those environments. So it's, it moves between the two, but it, it would be a high hazard material. The regulations establish dose rates that can come from the package, establishes the segregation distances, depends on the mode of transport and the conveyance, how that is applied. When you're undertaking actions required for security, we have to focus on using prudent actions, communic communicating clearly that there's a potential radiation hazard in the area where the package is located, securing the package in an area away from occupied areas, and limiting the time personnel are near the source. How do we do that when we're at the same time we're trying to establish a secure environment and we don't want potential adversaries knowing specifically what we're shipping, what the controls are? We'll be talking about that. For example, you have to mark your package with, and these are the uh, Types of markings are specified in the regulations. You label the package with labels such as you see here. A yellow three means that it has a fairly significant uh, contents with a external radiation level above specified levels. In some cases, we use placards on the outside of vehicles. You'll see placards like this on trucks going down the highway. That is intended to communicate to an emergency responder what's in, the pa what's in the vehicle if it's involved in an accident. At the same time, you can think of that as kind of a red flag for the adversary, saying, hey, there's, there's a potential target for me. So we'll be talking about how you can, uh, you'll have to work between the safety and the security sides of a regulatory house to decide whether you should or should not placard. Advanced notification, we'll be talking here about how do you provide that so it's uh, shared with only those people that have a, a, an interest in it. Now back to the international regime. The orange book is actually the UN recommendations. They're called model regulations. It's UN recommendations on transport of all dangerous goods radioactive material is class seven. Those recommendations make it in to the orange book basically by inputs from the IAEA. Now, again, I talked about the maturity of the safety and, uh, regime that's developed over the last seven, some decades. When, from a safety standpoint, the IAEA regulations for safe transport serve as a basis to feed here and over the years, basically everything that's in SSR 6 makes it into the Orange Book. The Orange Book is issued every two years, and from that, then, recognizing these are just recommendations, those recommendations make it into the various modal documents. For the United States, the two that we have to worry about most is the International Maritime Organizations International Maritime Dangerous Good Code, and the International Civil Aviation Organization's technical instructions. They become binding through conventions that the U.S. is a party to. For one, one thing you need to bring out, 49 CFR requires compliance with our It does not require compliance with our CAO, although most airlines use our You got them reversed. It's ICAO, it's ICAO that they're subject to, they're not allowed. Right. So 49 CFR is subject to the ICAO. Okay. That's not that's 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 
Okay. These two are binding on us. This by the SOLAS Convention, Safety of Life at Sea Convention, and this one by the Chicago Convention. Now, Jim points... The important thing is we get to a new 49 CFR. Yeah. Ultimately, we'll get there. Okay. This is part of the three-dimensional tapestry, if you want to think of it that way. In this case, the IATA, as Jim points out, that, that's an air transport document. They pretty well mimic the ICAO technical instructions. They actually call it I, I added dangerous goods regulations. But what's interesting is they add carrier specific requirements as well. So you have to go here to find out whether carrier A will allow me to do something. This all then uh, is those two modes of transport. The recommendations over here You've got the ADR, which is road transport in Europe, the ADN, uh, inter inland waterway in Europe, and the RID, which is rail transport in Europe. Okay. The IMDG code is mandatory on 162 different countries, including the US. 191 different, co different countries for ICAO. At the regional level, 48 countries have bought into the road requirements, 17 countries into the inland waterway, and 48 countries into rail. The U.S. is not party to those agreements or conventions. But if you are shipping from the U.S. to any, for example, to any European Union country, and, and it's going to be by any of these surface modes, you have to worry about what the requirements are in that country as well. So it becomes rather complex. Okay, the International Transport Security Governing Documents, Young Lou has already introduced you to them. They focus on uh, nuclear material, the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Material. You've got the amendment, you've got NS13, which is, we'll be talking about this a lot, it's called InfoCert 225, Revision 5. NNS 14 and 9 focus on the radioactive materials, but because nuclear materials are radioactive, you have to consider those as well. All radioactive materials are covered, again, by NS 9 and 14. From a safety standpoint, I've written TSR1, that should be SSR1. This is the pre, uh, previous edition, the 2009 edition of the safety regulations. And you have the UN model regulations, which I've just shown percolate down to the modal regulations. Now, you get over here to radioactive sources. There are 25 sources defined in the IEA Code of Conduct. There's a document which gives guidance on import and export of these sources, and that's coupled into the NNS 9 and 14. Show this little yellow box in the middle. That's because one of those sources is plutonium-239. So you have to worry about it from the source standpoint and the nuclear material standpoint and the overall global radioactive nature of it. This is just a, a, a broader look at these documents. For nuclear material, you've got the convention, the amendment. 13 is, uh, as I said, it, it's InfoCert 225, Revision 5. Uh, NNS 14 is Nuclear Security Recommendations on Radioactive Material. 15 is nuclear security recommendations uh, on nuclear and other uh, out of uh, nuclear and other radioactive material that are out of regulatory control. I mentioned that, but we won't talk about that during the course, but it's something you need to be aware of. And then in the guidance area, the NSF9 was basically the precursor to a lot of this. It came out about five, six years ago. And that was the basis for what we built the original training course on. And there is in the works an, uh, an unidentified document which will provide guidance supporting the NNS 13 document. All of this comes together as a set of recommendations and guidance from a nuclear material standpoint on how you apply it to nuclear material. Okay, for the code of conduct, that was developed uh, almost, the work on that started almost immediately after 9-11 and involved 
experts from many countries. They knew that if they tried to do this as a convention, it would take years to put it in place. So it was agreed that it would be a voluntary standard that various countries would raise their hand and say, yeah, verily, we will follow what's in the code. The U.S. has volunteered, as have many countries, to abide by the code. From a transport standpoint, it provides very limited guidance, but it does establish a basis for a greater approach for those 25 radioactive sources. For radioactive material, we have the NS-14 and NS-9 as depicted here, and you have the recommendations coming in from the UN. There is almost no correlation between these at this point. I expect and hope over the years that you will have correlation between these. These are recommendations. They're not binding. This is recommendations. They become binding when you move into the modal level. In the United States, what do we have? Well, we've got 49 CFR 171, 172. Uh, there's a whole raft, as you'll see as we move into this, of DOT requirements that apply to shipments of all dangerous goods, including radioactive materials. We have 10 CFR 73, 10 CFR 37. Other Title X requirements is applicable, and as of October 2nd, we'll be talking about this, there's a new NRC order that just came out. And these apply to nuclear material, some radioactive sources, and to all radioactive materials in general. And then DOE, Mike will be talking about the various manuals, uh, orders, and so on, the guides that DOE has for all radioactive materials. So what do we do worry about the interfaces? Well, from a safety standpoint, regulations do not specify controls such as routing or physical protection that may be instituted for reasons other than radiological safety. Does not talk about security. But it does say in that document, any such controls shall take into account the radiological and non-radiological hazards and shall not detract from the standards of safety that the regulations are intended to provide. You've got to work together and make sure you don't compromise safety when you're worried about security and vice versa, you don't compromise security when you're worried about safety. NS14 recommends that you look at the safety features. NS9 does much the same thing. The controls and communications are key to both safety and security. Application of these controls, preparing the package for dispatch by the consigner arranging for transport and transporting the package from the consigner to the consignee. You have to properly classify the contents, look at the uh, materials. Incidentally, the robustness of the package is based on the potential consequence of the contents if it's released. So in a sense, that helps couple into security. When you're shipping a very dangerous material, it's in a, one of the type B type packages, that will help contribute to security, as we'll see later. This is an, the interesting one I've already mentioned. And when it comes to placarding, we don't want to raise that, wave, wave that res, red flag in front of a potential adversary. So although from a safety standpoint, you may be required to have a placard, you can work with your regulators. And if, for example, your shipment is being accompanied by escort people in a separate vehicle, they can convey the message of what to emergency responders what's in the transport vehicle. And on that basis, you uh, can do away with the placard. In fact, DOE, as I recall reading what, what you put together, Mike, DOE says you don't re have to have placards on shipments where otherwise they would be required. We need to worry about interfacing with communication. How do you share information? For example, route and schedule. Recommendations that come from uh, the IEA and, and within, uh, many of the DO, uh, within many of the US requirements say that you only share that information with people who have a need to know. You stay away from a regular schedule if you can. 
you limit providing that advanced knowledge only persons who have a need to know. Conflicts may exist between the need to know for safety and the need to know for security. That has to be worked out. We'll talk about that in more detail. And you need to maintain continuity of sensitive information during transport. Incidentally, this is a picture I obtained from a colleague in France. That was not a terrorist act. But the truck drove off the road carrying a package, and uh, they, had, they spent a couple of days recovering from that, cleaning up the site, uh, getting under control. Information management. You want to make sure you integrate between safety and security and stay away from uh, using the placards. Make sure the advance notification is provided to those who need to know you don't advertise in the newspaper. Hmm. Labeling of packages also. If you're carrying a large package on an open vehicle, you may, be, you may want to cover up the, the labels. That again tells a net potential adversary that they've got a potential target there. The contents having low and moderate uh, pot potential consequences, they generally do not require robust packages, nor do they need robust security measures following the graded approach. When you go to high potential consequences, you go to robust packages. They may be penetration resistant. They'll be difficult to open. Uh, it's a large mass. They'll be difficult to move. So in general, safety requirements may also provide security benefits. Here's an example. This is a high-level waste package, a high-level waste cask, with a personnel barrier over it. And this is a, an infrared thermal image of the package itself, generating heat from its contents. That can be a protective measure from a security standpoint. An adversary tries to go in, and it's very hot. He can't work around the package. So that type of information can couple in uh, to help both safety and security. Similarly, this is a spent fuel cask in being transported in Europe, about a 100 ton cask, has a personnel barrier over it. Uh, but when you look at the vents that are there to allow convection heat to exit the package, that also might provide an opportunity for a adversary to put some type of explosive device through that hole next close to the package. So that has to be considered when you're looking at the interface between safety and security. Shown here are security seals. This is the uh, RFID tag that Young Lewis talked about. You go from what I call dumb seals to smart seals, uh, indicating whether tampering has occurred. Uh, again, we can follow a graded approach. You wouldn't use something like this on a, on a very small quantity of material, but for anything of consequence, you may want to use something that's monitoring the integrity of the package and tell you, telling you the location of the package. So in summary, I've tried to focus only on those aspects of transport safety that may benefit or conflict with security. The robustness of the package can be a very great benefit from a security standpoint. Safety culture, we'll talk about that a little later is generally based on open and shared information, whereas a security culture is based on protecting information. That's where you've got this conflict between safety and security. And safety and security measures must be designed and implemented to be integrated, and they should not conflict with each other. Well, that's kind of the goal of this course, is to talk about these aspects of safety versus security, look at the requirements from an international and domestic standpoint and figure out how best to approach security.